Welcome back, new Darktable user. We are up to the fourth and final installment of the Newbie's Guide to Darktable 4.2.0. In this episode, we are going to look at the rest of the Darkroom view. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 127 of Understanding Darktable. For this, I have just chosen another one of my crocodile images from my recent trip to the Northern Territory. Again, the image is not that important to what we're going to discuss. One thing I don't have on my notes that I do just quickly want to address, and that is that the thing I mentioned in 124 or 125 about Control F to display and hide the film strip in the light table view that also works in the darkroom view so you can very quickly jump to another image in your film strip just by clicking on the thumbnail and boom you're there all right next the histogram is up here in the top right hand corner it is like a histogram in any other image editing software it shows you the distribution of luminosities uh, with your shadows on the left and your highlights on the right and all your midtones in the middle. It also, in color images, will show you the distribution of each color channel and you can actually turn those on and off individually via the little colored swatches in the top right hand corner of the histogram. Turn them all back on and you can see, you know, individual channels with their red green and blue and wherever it's white then you've got information from all three color channels there's also the option to have a logarithmic or a linear view not sure why you might use that but some of you might have a reason for that and then the icon on the left allows you to switch between waveform view rgb parade view vector scope and then back to your histogram you'll also notice that there are these light gray highlight regions that appear when you mouse over the histogram. You can left click and drag to adjust the black point, but it's a pretty coarse adjustment, uh, simply by left clicking and dragging to the left or the right when you get the light gray highlight on that left hand, you know, one fifth of the histogram, or adjust the exposure for the entire image, which is the same as going to the exposure module and dragging the exposure slider, by left clicking and dragging to the left or the right when you've got the light gray highlight over the other 80% of the histogram. So you just left click and drag like so to do a very quick and dirty exposure adjustment to your entire image. Next up, the history module. The history module appears on the left hand side and it shows you everything that has occurred to an image since it was imported. Now, something that new users get frustrated by is if I was to hit the reset for this image, you will see that there are essentially 11 states from the original through to orientation in the history stack for this image. But we just reset it. This is a raw file. Why are there all of these history states? The analogy I've used in the past is this. Darktable is like the you know, Italian sports car that has the clear perspex hood that lets you see through to the engine and see all the fun stuff underneath. Most other software hides all of this information from the user. And to a certain extent, I can understand why, because these are not things you can change. I mean, things like white balance you can change, sure. Highlight reconstruction you might want to turn off if you know you didn't clip your, you know, your file at the time that you pushed the shutter button. Other software hides all this information, Darktable does not. And that is why you will see all of these things that are occurring to your raw data at the time of import. Now, things like Filmic, that comes down to a preference that I've got set. That may not be the case on your system. It depends how you have that preference set. And that preference is in processing. 
auto apply pixel workflow defaults to scene referred, display referred or none. Because I have it set to scene referred, filmic is automatically applied. And because filmic is automatically applied, the exposure is automatically adjusted half a stop up. And yeah. So you may not see quite as many options in your history stack. It'll all come down to the way you've got your preferences set within Darktable. All right, for the next thing I want to discuss, I'm going to jump back to this previous image, our black and white of our crocodile. The history module on the left hand side here will get a new entry every time you touch another module. So the last thing I did was tweaked the color balance RGB. So if I came over to say the contrast equalizer and I made a, a subtle tweak to that, we can now see that contrast equalizer has been added as the most recent history state. Now you will notice that there is also contrast equalizer at step 12. And if you do a lot of tweaking, moving between modules back and forth, this history stack, if you like, can expand quite quickly. And before you know it, you can have 30, 40, 50 history states and a lot of duplicates. At any time, if you want to clear that up, you can compress the history stack with the button at the bottom. And what that will do is any earlier instances will be dropped from being displayed in the history stack, which simply means you won't be able to go back to that exact point in time ever again. But whatever tweaks you made have been overwritten by the more recent entry. So if I compress the history stack now, this contrast equalizer in between lens correction and sigmoid will disappear because it's superseded by the contrast equalizer entry at step 16. Of course, all of these steps will then get renumbered depending on how many things get thrown away. So compress and we can see it disappeared from in between sigmoid and lens correction and we still have it at step 15. There's also a button here to create a style from the current history stack and like we saw in 124, 125, I can't remember which, uh, you can choose to include or exclude whichever modules you would like from the style that you are about to create. You give it a name in the first field. If you want to, you can give it a description in the second field, but that's not compulsory and you hit save. And of course, the reset button if you want to reset the history for that image back to whatever it was at the time of import. Next up, the duplicate manager. Back in the analog days, you would have had a strip of neg out of your camera. And if you were in the dark room, you would have been able to take that neg and create as many prints as you wanted. And you could change the way you printed each version. You know, you might have used different paper. You might have done different dodging and burning as the light was shining through the, the projector. You know, all different things that you could do at the stage of printing from the negative. And in the digital world, we have that same ability. And the beauty of Darktable's duplicate manager is we can create a duplicate which will include all of the history elements from the current process. So if I like everything about this, but maybe I want a crop that is 16.9, you know, landscape, not a portrait orientation. I could create a duplicate and then simply change the crop back to 16.9, like so, and like so. And now I've got my alternate crop with exactly the same processing. So we'd call this black and white portrait and we'd call this black and white landscape. And then I might think, well, I'd actually like to do a color version of this. So maybe I'll go original and that will give me another version where the history stack is basically reset to the way this raw file was at the time of import. Now, what I want to make clear is Darktable is not duplicating your RAW files because, you know, depending on the resolution of your camera, your RAW file could be anything from 20 megabytes to, who knows, 80 megabytes, 100 megabytes, you know, ridiculous amount of data. And you don't want to be duplicating 
the raw file every single time. What Darktable does is create one extra tiny little XMP file. Yes, the same ones we spoke about in episode 124 or 125 on your system. And they're like a couple of kilobytes each. They're tiny, but each one represents a different development version for the same source file. And the source file doesn't have to be a raw file. It could be a TIFF or a JPEG or a PNG. All of these different versions are simply extra XMP files on your hard drive. And like I said, they're just a couple of kilobytes each. If at any point you decide, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna go with the color version now, I can simply click on the X and that will remove, and it does ask for confirmation because it's actually deleting just the XMP file from your hard drive. Your raw data or whatever image you are you know, developing is not touched. It's just that XMP file gets thrown away. So that's the duplicate manager. Next up, an entry I've got on my notes here is wag the dog. And that's a phrase I came up with and you'll understand why in just a sec. Let's go to something like the rotate and perspective module. Wherever you see a slider, in any of these modules, you can left click and drag, or you can right click, and you get this funky little graph, which I've never seen in any other software, and it's really cool. If you move your mouse to the top of the graph and drag to the left or the right, the values are changed quite coarsely, and you know, same in the other direction. But if you drag your mouse down towards the bottom, you get very fine adjustment. In this instance, you know, 0.01 of a percent of rotation. So it's a really nice interface for just changing either coarse or fine, depending on how far up or far down the graph you have your mouse pointer. It's very clever. Now, what happens if you want an exact value on a slider? Let's say I want to rotate this to exactly 15 degrees. When you right click on that slider, you'll notice that just for a couple of seconds, you get a flashing cursor on the right hand side. While that flashing cursor is there, and I lost it because I moved my mouse, so I'll do that again. See that cursor? You can just type in with your numeric keypad or the keys above your QWERTY keys, the value that you want. I'll go 15, press enter, and my image is rotated to exactly 15 degrees. If you want a negative value, type in minus 10, click enter, and your image is rotated to exactly that value. So if you've got an image that you want to rotate to exactly 45 degrees, yeah, or something like that, you can do that. Want to get it back to zero? Just type in zero and enter, and you're good. Next up, I want to talk about masking, and I'm going to gloss over this pretty quickly simply because I recently did about a eight part series on masking. It's episodes 108 to 115. So if you really want to get into the masking, go and check those out. But basically, every module that does any sort of image manipulation, you know, or pixel manipulation, allows you to create a mask. If a mask is active on a module, you will see this little icon here, and that will show you where you've got a mask over this image. In this instance, what I've done is chosen a parametric mask to focus on the greens and the yellows. So that's all the foliage of the trees. And I desaturated those simply because if I set that back to zero, the green was quite overpowering in this image and I wanted to just reduce the saturation a little bit so that the bird had more of a chance of standing out because our eyes are very sensitive to green. That green was a little bit overwhelming. So you have the ability to do a uniform mask, a drawn mask, a parametric mask, a drawn and parametric mask, and a raster mask. Like I said, if you want more information, go and check out episodes 108 to 115. Associated with the masking is the mask manager. 
And again, I'm not going to dive into this right now because I covered it in that series that I mentioned a minute ago. But the mask manager will allow you to work with a mask that you might have generated in one module and apply it in another module. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you've gone to great pains to draw a mask, then you can use that mask across multiple modules. Next up, the hamburger icon in the bottom left hand corner here will allow you to see your presets. Now, this will only be user created presets for any modules that you've currently got active. I generally don't save presets because I prefer to tweak everything from scratch. But if I had, they would appear here. Beside that, we've got the quick access for applying any of your styles. So if you have created and saved styles, which I have done here, uh, I can quickly add a style by you know, choosing it from this list. And as you will see, you will get a quick thumbnail uh, preview of how the image would look if you went ahead and applied any of these styles. So if I wanted my Instagram frame, boom, there it is done. And as you can see, it just added a framing module to my history stack. And I can just go back to my previous state if I don't want that and then compress to discard the framing module from the history. Next up, we've got the display the image on a second monitor. So that will give you a second window that, you know, if you have a second monitor that you'd prefer to drag this off to, you can do that. Over here on the right hand side, we've got the focus peaking mode that will show you which parts of your image have focus. Beside that, we've got the color assessment conditions. Aurelian does recommend that if you are really trying to get accurate highlights and shadow information that you should check this before you print your image. Uh, it simply gives you, as you can see, a white background around the image just so you can neutralize your eyes. I mean, this neutral gray that is the default now for Darktable is meant to help with that so that you're not fooled into either crushing the blacks too much or pushing your highlights too much. If you work with the black background, that is a possibility. Uh, and I think it was, was a control B. Yeah, control B for that one. Next up, we've got the raw clipping indicators. So if there is any clipped data in your raw file, like we have here in the clouds here and over here, that will appear as this cross hatch pattern. And the color of that will tell you which color channel has been clipped. So in this, particular image, I've got just a little bit of clipping in my green channel. Obviously, if you have clipped your raw data, then your ability to recover that information is limited. Do with it as you will. We then have the normal clipping indicators, and this takes into account whatever image processing you have done. So although our raw indicator just shows a little bit of clipping in the raw data, if I was to come in and make some really, you know, stupid adjustment to sigmoid, like, oh, wow, I can't even drive that hard enough to create any clipping. Uh, let me undo that. Let me turn off sigmoid. And there we go. We can see that there is a massive amount of clipping in the highlights uh, once I turn sigmoid off. But if I turn sigmoid back on, it brings everything back into bounds for me. I definitely always check the clipping indicator before I export my images just to make sure that I haven't actually clipped anything with my processing. Next up, we've got the soft proofing. I will confess to not really understanding soft proofing. I don't have a calibrated monitor, but if you're in that field, you probably already understand what that does. Next up, we've got the gamut check. So again, if you are really driving your processing hard, it's worth turning on the gamut check just before export to make sure you haven't driven any of your color channels out of gamut. That will particularly be important if you're planning on printing. And finally, the guidelines. These are simply there to aid in, you know, choosing where to crop an image or where to position the subject within the frame. And if you right click on that, you can choose, you know, all different sorts of 
guidelines or whatever it is that you want to choose. Oh, one final thing that I just remembered. If you are a new user and you are on the Windows operating system, just be aware there is no ability to print your images from Darktable. The reason for that is because Darktable started on Linux. It then went to Mac uh, and Windows was the last operating system to be supported. I guess the mechanics for printing inside of Darktable uses something called CUPS, C-U-P-S. I don't know what CUPS stands for. I'm sure I could go and look it up, but it, it doesn't exist on Windows. Uh, and that is rather unfortunate and it doesn't look like that's going to change anytime soon. So what that does mean is that if you want to print your images on Windows, you will simply need to do your processing in Darktable, go to the export module, export in whatever format you deem necessary. You know, if, you, if you're really concerned about keeping the most amount of data, then you might export it as a 16-bit TIFF file. But if you've done all your processing, it's probably safe to export it as a JPEG, but with, you know, quality of 95. So, yeah, there's not a whole lot of compression going on. I'll leave that to you to decide. And then print from some other piece of software on Windows. It is frustrating, I know, particularly for people who've decided to check out Darktable, who are Windows users, who are sick of the Adobe, you know, ransomware. And it's just an unfortunate state of being. And like I said, I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. All right, people, that is it, newbies. You are up to speed. Like I said, there's a whole bunch of other videos that you can go and check out from my channel. And I would highly encourage you to, you know, use the search function on YouTube uh, because that will allow you to find things that I've covered in certain videos. And I would just like to, at this point, mention, and I, you will, you will work this out as you spend more time on my channel. I don't make a habit of making a big song and dance about this, but because this is a newbies video, I would like to mention my Patreon. If you want to support what I do on Patreon, please hit up the link that's in the description down below the video. Uh, there are four different tiers. Each tier gives you a different level of benefits, if you like. All Patreon supporters get to see these videos four days prior to them going up for free to the regular YouTube audience. And like I said, for each tier, there are more benefits involved. So yeah, feel free to check that out if you want to support what I do. All right. Glad to have you as a new Darktable user. I hope you're enjoying the software. Uh, I have no dog in the hunt regarding the development of Darktable. I'm not a developer. I wouldn't know how to write a line of code if my life depended on it. Uh, I'm just a guy who loves the software. Uh, and I do my best to help people get up and running with it. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Questions, comments, feedback, sing out down below. And... Uh, I will catch you in the next one.